Hi, welcome to today's Hi. lecture. My name welcome is Indokan Jokin. I'm your lecturer for PUR 6. I'm your lecturer for PUR 6. Today we are going to look at another important topic. Today we are going to look at important topic. And that topic is concerned. And that topic is concerned. What is the meaning of concession? What are the implications of concessional statements? What are the concessional statements? What are the conditions that are meeting? What are the conditions for admitting when is confessional statement said to be valid? When is confessional statement said to be valid? These are the issues we are going to examine in today's lecture. These are the issues we are going to examine in today's lecture. I hope you find them quite interesting. Thank you. Once again, you welcome to today's lecture. At the end of this lecture, you should be able to define and explain the nature of confession discuss conditions for the admissibility of confession and determine the effect of confession. Section 28 of the Evidence Act defines a confession. It says that a confession is an admission made at any time by a person charged with a crime, stating or suggesting the inference that he committed that crime. So confession can be made at any time. A confession can be made even before somebody is charged, accused is charged to court. So confession can be made at that material time. Confession can be judicial, it can be extrajudicial. Confession is judicial when it is made in open court in the course of proceedings. Confession is extrajudicial when it is made otherwise in the course of proceedings. In other words, an extrajudicial confession is a judicial con is a confession which is not made in open court. Now, Section 29 of the Evidence Act, Subsection 1 provides that in any proceeding, a confession made by a defendant may be given in evidence against him in so far as it is relevant to any matter in any issue in the proceedings and is not excluded by the court in pursuance of this section. Now let's look at the nature of confession. We've already said that a confession may be judicial or it may be extrajudicial. A confession may, must be direct, positive on, or, and unequivocal before it can be admitted in evidence. Now, in the case of Afolabi vs. COP, it was held that the alleged confession was neither direct nor positive, and therefore it was rendered inadmissible as a result. In the case of Sile vs. State, the court held that a confessional statement is part of the evidence adduced by the prosecution. A court can still convict on a confessional statement alone, even if the accused person results from it. And the confessional statement does not become inadmissible merely because an accused person denies having made it. So, even if the accused person denies that he did not make that particular statement, that, that particular statement is still, that particular confessional statement is still admissible in court. And the failure, you know, of the admissibility of a confessional statement and its later restriction cannot vitiate the proceedings. So the fact that the accused person failed to object to the admissibility of a confessional statement and later retracted that statement cannot vitiate the proceedings. And if we look at Aru vs. It was held that a confessional statement does not become inadmissible merely because the accused person denies having made it. So we are saying that a confessional statement must be direct, it must be positive, and it must be unequivocal. In the next slide, we are going to look at a class activity and we will be asked to provide answer to that class activity. discuss the meaning and nature of confession.
Now, let's look at the conditions for admissibility of, conf of the confessional statement. We have already looked at some of the conditions. We said that the confessional statement must be positive. It must be direct and it must be unequivocal. Now, let's look at section 29 sub 1, which we've already read out. And, so, and section 29 sub 2, which says, if in any proceeding where the prosecution proposes to give in evidence a confessional a confession made by a defendant it is represented to the court that the confession, confession was made was or may have been obtained by oppression of the person who made it or be in consequence of anything said or done which was likely in the circumstances existing at the time to render unreliable any confession which might be made by him in such consequence. The court shall not allow the confession to be given in evidence against him, except in so far as the prosecution proves to the court beyond reasonable doubt that the confession, notwithstanding that it may be true, was not obtained in a manner contrary to the provision of this section. Now, before a confessional statement can be obtained, can be admissible in court it must be made without oppression that's the essence of section 29 now the next question is what do we mean by oppression section 29 subsection 5 defines oppression as used in sub, as used in, sub, in subsection 2 it says in this section oppression includes torture inhuman or degrading treatment and the use or threat of violence whether or not amounting to torture therefore if a confessional statement is, a, is obtained as a result of oppression then that of uh, that that confessional statement is inadmissible in court and section 29 sub 5 have told us what is the meaning of, of oppression and it defined and it defined oppression in an inclusive manner. He said it includes, includes torture. It includes violence or threat of violence. It includes inhuman treatment and degrading treatment. So if there is any confessional statement which was obtained as a result of this in the, uh, was obtained in these circumstances that confessional statement is inadmissible if we look at the case of Akpan versus state he said a confessional statement is an admission made by a person the duty of the court is to consider the circumstances under which it was given and to decide what weight is to be attached to it if a, if a an accused person confesses that he made that confessional statement and admits that he made them then there's no need to contest or to go into trial within a trial the court would then have to look at that confessional statement and attach weight to it then if the accused person deny having made the confessional statement voluntarily then the court must determine whether that confessional statement was made voluntarily or not and the court will then undertake what is called trial within a trial in order to determine whether that confessional statement was made voluntarily or not if the court decides that that confessional statement was not made voluntarily then that confessional statement is inadmissible but if the court comes to a conclusion that that confessional statement was made voluntarily then that confessional statement is admitted in, in evidence now if we look at if we look at the case of R versus Priestley, it was held to my to was held that to my mind this word imports something which tends to sap and has sapped that free will which must exist before a confession is voluntary. Whether or not there is oppression in an individual case depends upon many elements. They include such things as the length of time intervening between periods of questioning, whether the accused person has been given proper refreshment or not, 
and the characteristics of the person who makes the statement. These are the things the court will take into cognizance before it will determine whether the confessional statement was made freely or it was made as a result of oppression of the accused. Now, if we let us look at the effect of confessional statement on a co accused. For that purpose, we need to look at section 29.4 of the Evidence Act. Section 29.4 of the Evidence Act says that we are more persons than one are charged jointly with an offense, and a confession made by one of such persons in the presence of one or more of the other persons so charged is given in evidence. The court shall not take such statement into consideration as against any of such other persons in whose presence it was made unless he adopted the same statement by words or conduct. Now, it means that a confessional statement made by a co-accused is not bound on the other accused persons unless the other accused persons adopts such statements. And they can adopt such statements either by words or conduct. That is the position of the law. Uh, for that purpose, we need to look at the case of Ozaki versus State. We also need to look at the case of Tanko versus State. Let's look at effect of secrecy and deception on confession. The fact that somebody was promised that confessional statement is going to be kept secret, does he initiate the admissibility of such a confessional statement? Let us look at section 31 of the Evidence Act. It says, if a confession is otherwise relevant, it does not become irrelevant merely because it was made under a promise of secrecy or in consequence of a deception practice on the defendant for the purpose of obtaining it or when he was drunk or because it was made in answer to questions which he need not have answered, whatever may have been the form of these questions or because he was not warned that he was not bound to make such statement and that evidence of and that evidence of it might be given so if somebody was promised that if he makes a confessional statement that confessional statement is, is going to be kept secret and he makes that confessional st st uh, statement it does not render that confessional statement inadmissible even if a deception was played on the accused person and he made and he made those confessional statement it is still admissible in court the, the the deception that was played on the accused person does not render the confessional statement inadmissible also if the confessional statement was made when the accused person was drunk it does not render the 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 particular confessional statement inadmissible in the next slide will be asked a class activity and will be required to provide an answer to it discuss the conditions for the admissibility of confessions today we have looked at the nature of confession we have looked we have examined confession the definition of confession and we have seen the different types of confession and the conditions for their for, for its admissibility we also come to the conclusion that a confessional statement that is direct positive unambiguous and made voluntary is actually the best form of evidence that can be obtained by the accused person and the con and the court can convict on it except where the law disallows it thank you